Welcome back one and all to another episode here at the Damage Report. A big old Friday show, Brett Ehrlich joins us as always. Brett Ehrlich, are you filled with holiday cheer today? I am, you could see our family oh. these stockings held from the blinds with care. <laughs> um, filled with the, tiny bottles of alcohol, no This doubt. is the best, this is the best stocking in the world. This is a Christmas like tree. It. Where you open the, it has like a little cartoon mouth, and you fill the mouth. I like it. It's awesome. That's a pretty Christmassy background. I don't think anyone's gonna beat Sabrina's background for Christmassiness, but I do like it. Or her um, thirst trap, for that matter. Good morning. I don't know if anyone saw her Instagram. Well. I thought you were talking about the Grinch thing. I get what you're saying. Um, the uh, apologies to our audience who uh, we have a, a tradition uh, uh, before the show that we didn't get. Someone said no romp this morning. And uh, I'm assuming they're talking about romps because I learned this morning that a romp is also the name for a group of otters. And I know that because oh. of the otters that mauled a man in Singapore. <laughs> so anyway. Oh My God, how did I go this long <laughs> knowing Not that knowing it's that. a quote murder of crows? But not and a, a flock of, of seagulls, but never knowing it's a romp of otters. Yeah, which and it, is I think it's an, an HOA of Karen's. Yes, I an think. HOA. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lots customer of service time. brigade of Karen's. <laughs> um, I do want to say that John and I were planning main show literally seven yeah. seconds before we started. That's what was happening. We were like, what story, story do you want? Stuff. Do you want to add this union story? Okay, good. And Marissa's like this. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're figuring it out. So uh, carefully chosen, but it's gonna be an exciting show today because uh, Jenks gone, we, we banned him. Not on my show, I say. Instead, we've got Nina Turner and Francesca Fiorentini in the first hour. How exciting is that? And uh, Brett, you sort of alluded to the content of the second hour, but you didn't say who it is. So who's on the second hour? Second hour is J.R. Jackson, Ida Rodriguez, and Nalini Stamp from the That's Working People's awesome. Party. It's gonna be a really, really, really great, great two hours um, of no. both like intense news discussion. Cause John likes to make the Friday power panels more discussion-y and he's right. It makes sense. Absolutely right. <laughs> so the first story is gonna be about this counter narrative thing that the, the, the Democrats have finally decided to push. Mm -hmm. And then um, yeah, and then the second hour, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be really, really awesome. Nice, awesome. Someone suggested a cringe of Karen's. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we do have uh, a lot to get to through the course of the next 90 minutes. We're gonna be talking about uh, Christmas and try to fill you with holiday cheer. We've got some music for you today. Uh, but in addition to that, we're gonna talk about this uh, plot to bring Donald Trump back into government, not as president, mind you, but in a different role. So we're gonna evaluate that. What's the matter with Georgia? Inflation and a really interesting story out of Georgia that I'm wondering if we're gonna disagree on. And then of course, to close it out, garbage people. I've got a very petty little garbage person today. I don't know Brett's, but I'm excited to find out. And if you're excited, show it by hitting the like button and sharing the stream and doing all of those nice holiday algorithmic things that we need. And if you wanna send us comments, tweets, super chats, all that will respond as we go. But Brett, with all that said, how would you like to be serenaded? I am so happy to do it after you take, cuz this is bothering me, you have two of these and one is up on your shoulder and it's all I've been able one to look at always. since the show started. Now this is gonna bother you, Ugh. does this bother you? <laughs> now it does, there we go. Anyway, I think uh, you're, you're welcome to every OCD it's gonna person in the chat. It, it, no. At some point, oh. I get, Set, I get like rowdy and, and one goes over the shoulder and now I can't get it. Uh, it's on me. It's there, John. It's I hate it so much. It. All right. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Oh, no, I think it's ruined for the rest of my life. Okay, great. Well, I ruined that. Anyway, uh, with that, why don't we jump into this video? Bridget. Let's end this emergency. I don't want a lot for Christmas, just body autonomy. I don't care about the variants because of natural immunity. I just want my freedom now. 
the Constitution will show us how. Make my dreams come true. And the state of emergency and acknowledge early treatment. Two. So that was uh, at a board of supervisors meeting. Board of supervisors meeting, board of education meeting. You shouldn't go anymore because that's pretty much what it is. Um, Brett, what did you think of Bridget there? She's going to help end this state of emergency with uh, the appropriation of that classic Mariah Carey tune. Um, that is the final form of what <laughs> everyone thinks they're doing at a school board or board of supervisors meeting. Because yeah. in everyone's mind, in every rant you've seen so far of what I don't. Just continue, just continue. And look at John's cross. He's doing this while I'm talking. He's just crossing. continue. He's just, just continue. Uh. So anyway. everyone thinks at a board, everyone thinks at a board of supervisors meeting that they or a school board meeting that they are doing the most amazing aria, yeah. nailing the karaoke performance of the karaoke performance, as this will be known forever. And everyone who has any ear for music or sanity, yeah. Here's nails on a chalkboard. Now, hold on. So I see what you're saying, and I think that a lot of people in the audience seem like they agree with you. And we've got more to play, which might buttress your point. But I will say, as much as I hate ignorance around COVID and all that, I it could have been worse. I feel like the no. the change in the lyrics was semi clever. I feel like it kind of petered out near the end there, but I thought that Bridget wasn't that bad in that first bit. That's what makes it so Awful, bad. But not bad, you know? No, it is exactly what's wrong with the, the headspace she's at because she's fine. She can carry a tune. She mm -hmm. thinks that she's amazing. That's the problem. Yes, that is definitely true. Because all of her, but she goes, she just makes up notes in that scale in her final trills, which I'm sure you true. will ram home in the next clip. Exactly, that's true. Um, yeah, the notes normally that can only be hit by the lizard people in the choir. <laughs> um, yes, and but but look, we've seen we've seen the whole spectrum of these things. Do you remember the 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 big guy? Who was like a wind is blowing across America? The guy with the, the dread, liberty, yeah, white dread, dude. I like this way better than the like the threats of death guy. So, but that said, while I appreciated some of the lyrical choices there, um, I think she put most of her attention on the first part of the song, as will be demonstrated in this uh, video. Ivermectin, not just horse pace and hydroxychloroquine, vitamin C and vitamin D, then the zinc and quercetin. I won't wear a useless mask. I don't need to stay at home, and my kids should go to school. We don't need to be alone. I just want my freedom now. The Constitution will show us how make my dreams come true, baby. I end the emergency. Let's have a happy holiday, everybody. It's a, it sort of fell apart there, but um, yeah, the rhymes were a little bit off. I, I also I don't understand the my kids need to go to school. We don't need to be alone. It sounds like you want to be alone. You don't want yeah. your kids to be around is what it seems like. Actually, you kind of want to get that kid out of there, which I sort of get. But yeah, it fell apart. But that's you know, the only thing. Rhyming hydroxychloroquine is tough. John, I know you wrote new lyrics to that song. So do you want me to? <laughs> oh, I get ready to cut his mic, please. John doesn't want a lot for Christmas. There is just one thing he knows. Oh God. He has a weird fetish and everybody knows it's about people's toes. <laughs> he just Not wants even. to be alone. Look, I'm a so well-known soul man, so let's be clear about that. 
Anyway, um, look, so her name is Bridget. It's a San Diego County Board of Supervisors. I, I, I love to focus on these stories that take place in California because I think some people in other parts of the country, and especially the world, think, oh, well, at least California is sort of rational. No, we're insane. And Orange County and San Diego are just crazy. Long Beach, sorry, Sophie. Um, why was she doing that? Well, she wanted to oppose the extension of a local health emergency order to combat. COVID-19, the board did end up approving it, but just three to two. So they are keeping it in order. So what are some of the recommendations the board voted for? Monoclonal treatments, which they say that they want. Extensive testing, which I guess they're against. Antibody and data collection and a future presentation on natural immunity. I don't even understand what of that she's opposed to, except you notice she threw in that masks are useless. And so it's it's like there's something about, I tweeted about this earlier. There are not a lot of people who are like, oh my God, COVID is really scary and real because it's a Chinese bioweapon. So conspiracy theory number one. So we need to be careful. We need to wear masks and take ivermectin. Like they never do that. It's all, all of the arrows have to be pointing in the same direction. It's not serious and you don't need to care about it, but it's also a bioweapon. And you definitely shouldn't do anything to stop yourself from getting it. But literally anything that they say on the internet is a treatment that isn't I'll believe. And I don't know why it always lines up that way. Why is there nobody who's like just likes ivermectin or believes it's real but doesn't want to wear a mask? I don't, I don't understand it. That's what's so frustrating is because it's that everybody on all sides say that they just want to do things that are safe. Sort of like that's it. They, a lot of people are like, let's try it. Let's just try it. Let's try ivermectin. Fine. That's mm-hmm. BS. There's no support for that. The difference is like there's support for all the stuff that we're suggesting you try. Like even Ron lie. Wyden, or not Ron Wyden, uh, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, which is hilarious just to say, Ron Johnson <laughs> of Wisconsin was saying we should gargle mouthwash. And a bunch of people are like, yeah, we should gargle mouthwash. They just need to be the one that came up with the idea. Sure. Is the difference. I don't need to be the one who came up with the idea. I need people who know what's happening to come yeah. up with the idea. And the idea needs to make sense to me when you describe it. Yeah. But like, yeah, they, they want it to have been Joe Rogan or Alex Jones or some other a hole online that told him that. It, like, if, if, if Dr. Fauci came out and told them to take ivermectin, they'd turn against it. Maybe it's too late, but early on, they definitely would have. Yeah. Anyway, um, what we what we should realize though and focus on was acknowledged by BS Nuss in the Twitter, who said, "Next congresswoman from that district." Nike, I lost. I lost. Is lost she this. okay? You don't need your guitar. Uh, arguably more cogent, more connected to reality than Marjorie Green, Bridget there, and certainly a better singer. Oh, Make by the way, John's um, wish come true. So please. Take a photo of your feet with out shoes. He found it. He found baby. it. <laughs> you got there. I like that. I appreciate that. Anyway, um, little reminder: the nation is now averaging 120,000 new COVID cases per day. The first time that mark has re- been reached since the latter stages of the summer Delta variant fueled in September. More than 60,000 Americans are hospitalized with the virus. That has jumped 20%. From two weeks ago. So, just a little reminder, a pointless reminder, because nobody cares anymore. Uh, it's still bad and it's getting worse again. So, that's cool. Anyway, ready for a little bit more fun? Let's jump awesome. into this video. Ask me, why are you here? I'm here because these colors don't run. <laughs> 80 years ago this week, they tried to extinguish the darkness at a place called Pearl Harbor. We didn't fold then and we won't fold now because we've come this far by faith. In our tradition, we say this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. The red, the white, the blue and the light of America, we're going to let it shine. So I know 
you know, after the tree was initially burned, some people actually tried to get out in front of some of what Foxes say about it. And at least one individual at Media Matters did say they would compare it to Pearl Harbor. But I think they were joking at the time. But no, they got there. Reverend Jacques de Graff said they tried to extinguish the darkness at a place called Pearl Harbor. I don't know exactly what he means by that phrase, but yes, this is their Pearl Harbor, Brett Ehrlich. Their holiday display was briefly burned down. Was that guy trying to look like Reverend Run? Like he had the that hat. Very weird. Anyway, so the, this guy is comparing some dude who was having some issues and lit a maybe a fight. There is no like felony level arson charge levied because they didn't show malice or it wasn't a, a, an explicit hate crime. There's no evidence of that. And do they not trust the uh, the the boys Police. in blue to divide to, to come up with that? Clearly um, not. They're comparing the, the actions of one person to the enemy in World War II, like Hirohito. <laughs> like <laughs> this is an insane argument that is not new. They they have to keep one upping each other, coming up with more and more ridiculous things. It's like he he opened a newspaper and was like, I guess it's like the, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, so why not make that leap? Yeah, so I would say it's look. He's a commentator on Fox News, and how would you like if you wanted to be con- liked by the audience and you wanted to be brought yeah. on more shows on Fox? How easily, Brett, could you figure out the sorts of things you'd need to say? And this is 100% one of the things you should. He, I'm surprised that he was the first to say it, honestly. We went like two full days in the news, and Ducey didn't think to compare it to Pearl Harbor. Like none of the others did. It was an inevitability. Like that, that's definitely where this train is eventually going to reach. And there's no um, guarantee that he's the first person to say it. My guess with a lot of these folks is that they saw someone on Twitter say it. Sure, sure. And they're yeah. like, I'm but just going to say this show. and pretend it's mine. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, I want to remind that- people though, uh, as you alluded to, uh, Pearl Harbor was actually serious. Uh, let's see, killed uh, 2,403 US military personnel and 68 civilians. Reminder, no one was killed. No one was even hurt when the tree was burned down. And it's an interesting test of Fox News, a reminder of what Fox News is that the tree was burned down late at night. And most people found out about it the next morning, and especially when Fox and Friends was talking about it. By the time that morning had come, the police had already been made clear that this was an individual with mental health difficulties and there was no evidence of a political motivation or any sort of ideological motivation. So the police, if you trust them, as Brett said, had already gotten out in front of this and said, no, 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 that's just BS, there's there's no evidence of that. So like there wasn't even a period of ambiguity to make the case that it was a hate crime or targeting them because they're conservative. But they just ignored that and steamrolled right through and it's been a solid near week of just yes, this is obviously a hate crime against Christians, and they're targeting us because we're Fox News. They didn't care at all about the official statement from the police, which by the way, you should be more critical of those statements. And it is still possible that this was motivated by politics. But as of right now, there's literally no evidence of it and reason to believe that it's not. And they didn't even stumble over that fact. Yeah, it's so good. Uh, Megan McCain went on Twitter immediately and said things like, I don't want anyone to tell me about how radical these Republicans are when there's people burning down the Christmas tree outside of Fox News. And it was not politically motivated, it had nothing to do with anything. There's no evidence to that effect. No. And she no. deleted it. And her previous e- her yeah. previous tweet, as someone pointed out on Twitter, was about how radical Tucker Carlson was. There is no self awareness. And that's the thing is they will say two things that are diametrically opposed from, you know, if you use reason. But they'll at the same time say that no one is radical in my party and that person is radical in my party. Yeah. And it's, it's insane. But my favorite thing in this category that happened on Fox News was Ainsley Earhart literally saying, The Christmas tree is a symbol of something that brings us together. It's a symbol of Christmas. It's a symbol of Hanukkah. (laughs) 
What? What's the problem with that? You just so do? I know there's not a lot of context clues to say what holiday a Christmas tree represents, mm-hmm. but it is Christmas. Hanukkah has a whole bunch of other stuff. The Christmas tree is so cool that the Jews came up with the Hanukkah bush, which yeah. no one uses, and I think was only in an SNL <laughs> sketch. But, but don't you love that? Like she is, it's easy to respond to what she said as just ignorance, which it kind of is, but it's it's more than that. It's sure, no, I she knows it's a Christmas thing, but she believes. Yeah, but we're Christians, we're the best, we're everything. You all are lucky to be able to use some of our symbols. It's more a supremacy thing than an ignorance thing, I think. And you're right, and we, the Jews know it. They know, we know that Christmas is way cooler <laughs> than Hanukkah. We know that Hanukkah is about pants, buying new pants and socks <laughs> for like four days. And then like a battery on the fifth day. And you're like, what's the battery for? Maybe that's the sixth day. Ooh, that is but exciting. It's, it's oh, that. And everyone says, like, oh, you get eight days of presents. It's not as cool. We get it. Yeah. Stop trying to ram it down our face. And stop trying to speak for Jews. This is what's so weird. Talk, think about any Christian you know. They kind of hate Jews or they think they're weird. They're like, why aren't you watching the sequel we made to your book? <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you? Why don't you think the sequel is better than the original? Yeah. And also, we added a bunch of crap to the original that we still call the Old Testament. Crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah. But they want us to be so jazzed about it. But then at the same time, they hate us. And then at the same time, they're like, "But we need to protect you, people." Yeah, because you love Israel too. When there's a lot of Jews being like, "There's a lot of weird stuff going on in Israel that we don't." Yeah. Agree about, but then they're saying let's create. They always say Judeo Christian, like it yeah, represents like the Judeos have any care about that or role in it. No, yeah, Judeo- it's against Christian. supremacy, and it's less about what's in the Judeo Christian and more about what's not included in that. Yeah. Because while yeah, they love to focus on the sequel, they also have no interest in the third installment of that trilogy. By the way. <laughs> Right. But anyway, um, with that, we are going to take uh, our first break. Lots to come after this. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, with that, let's jump into something uh, far more serious. <clears throat> we found out earlier this week that uh, in the days leading up to January 6th, when the uh, riot at the Capitol happened, uh, those in Trump's inner circle had apparently organized a PowerPoint presentation for possible options for ending democracy in America. As it was, we we knew previously that it was 38 pages long. It was titled "Election Fraud, Foreign Inter- Interference, and Options for January 6th. I love that like every single person that put this together, that's in the meeting around it, that is going to be talking about this PowerPoint, knows exactly what they're doing. But they still have to like pretend that it's justified. So they say election fraud, foreign interference, all of that. It's just they want to stop the certification of the vote. So we knew that. We knew that a couple of days ago. Mark Meadows had apparently provided it to the January 6th committee before he ended his cooperation with that body. But now we have some of the actual slides from the PowerPoint. So let's jump into that. So here's one. First of all, graphic design, very much their passion. So VP Pence seats Republican electors. Over the objections of Democrats in states where fraud occurred. Let's be clear about that. So we sort of need to break these down. When that first line says seats Republican electors, what they mean is there were electors chosen for these states, and Republicans in the states just decided, no, we don't like that. So here are a bunch of randos that we've chosen instead. They're not electors in any way, they're just a group of Republicans that want Trump to be president. So they want to do that. VP Pence could reject the electors from states where fraud occurred. And we know we know how they're defining where fraud occurred. It's where they think it needed to have occurred to explain why Trump lost. Uh, causing the election to be decided by remaining electoral votes. So again, just cancel out enough states until de facto Trump wins, that's it. They're pretending as if there's still ambiguity after that. So we get rid of the objective fraud and then I guess we'll see who wins after that. We don't know, tune in. 
or delay the decision in order to allow for a vetting and subsequent counting of all the legal paper ballots. So they were gonna begin to cancel out individual votes around the country until again, Trump had won. So out of the two slides we have, Brett, this is the less, less terrifying one. But what do you make of the options they laid out there so far? Now, Hannah Arendt quoted, uh, coined a phrase, the banality of evil. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing more banal and evil than a PowerPoint about destroying democracy. Mm -hmm. Like boring, not even a fun PowerPoint. There's no clip art. Nothing's animating on. There's no background music or inlaid videos. This is a PowerPoint to destroy the Constitution of the United States of America. It was like add a slide, but don't like delete and customize. This whole thing <laughs> was just click and replace ipsum dolor locator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because none of this has any relationship to law, to the Constitution, anything. It's what is the plausible deniability that we can use to just end actual elections in this country? Right, and that's um, and, and it, it's 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 people passing it around. There's a lot of presentations that exist out there. There's a lot of contingency plans that a lot of people have just in case. And usually those contingency plans are not. How do we undo like the ones I want passed around in the halls of Congress are not how do we undo the Constitution? It's how do we protect against the dissolution of the Constitution? Sure, yeah. So um, you're 100 percent right, but let's let's go into a few more of those mechanisms. So uh, their recommendations that they provided were brief senators and congressmen on foreign interference. I don't even know now. I'm so like I've lost the track of a couple of their conspiracy theories. I don't even know what that's a reference to now. Is that like the Hugo Chavez thing with Dominion? Is that yeah, China? I so. Is that I, I, I honestly don't even know. The next one though is declare national security emergency. That seems important. The fourth is declare electronic voting in all states invalid. So. We have been gaslit quite a bit from right wing media throughout this year about this isn't a coup. How could you say that? Having the sitting president say, we're going to declare a national security emergency and begin nullifying votes, possibly entire states if necessary, until I'm still president is like it's the most coup thing ever. Technically, and just to be clear, it's what's referred to as a self coup or an auto coup. It's a form of coup d'etat in which a nation's leader, having come to power through legal means, dissolves or renders powerless the national legislature and unlawfully assumes extraordinary powers not granted under normal circumstances. That can include annulling the nation's constitution, suspending civil courts, and having the head of government assume dictatorial powers. So they were going to begin nullifying states, choosing their own electors, getting rid of millions of votes. Under the guise of a national security emergency, while pretending inter interference happened from abroad, that is the most. This is everything that we spent years saying they might try to do, but because we still technically have Biden in pre in office, they didn't succeed in it. If you acknowledge that what they did was the most stereotypical coup attempt ever. Then you are the crazy person. There's something wrong with you. You're hysterical. You're an extremist. You're radical, there, Brett. Yes, and the chat's really trying to find the perfect wording for this, and the answer is actually auto moronic cusfixiation. There's a lot of auto curotica. <laughs> well, that's, that's the podcast one. title, I think. <laughs> yeah, auto curotic. Yeah, anyways, auto moronic cusfixiation. This is this is the. Just to put it all in perspective, it has become very clear that the previous situation where like uh, politicians did politician things and the Republican approach was just to do all the homework and the behind the scenes things to make sure that they use the constitution and they use all the uh, actual tools at their disposal to not break the law, but essentially 
use the the like way in the weeds mechanisms of the American system to solidify power and then not really care about the messaging due to BS messaging out there. It has changed to getting everyone in the Republican Party, the voters, everybody out there to think that the mechanisms of American democracy are BS shouldn't exist. And all these people who are saying, let's value the Constitution and what it stands for actually are arguing for the for dissolving it. And those people, this is a different version of what you're saying, but those are the ones who say they want to make America great again. America has never been the way you want it to be. Mm. America was actually designed to stop you from making these kinds of choices, from creating a king. Because this entire PowerPoint presentation is what BS quasi almost real sounding mechanism can we use to get rid of America? That's it. You want to get rid of it. You're a tra- you're a traitor. This is treason. These are the boring plans of people who hate this country and what it was designed to do, which is prevent a king from saying there is no democracy. Yeah. Try to stop exactly that. And and that's because, why and you're America. right you're about the banality because there's no like explosion gifts playing in that PowerPoint. It's oh, it's just you know they try to do it and and we move on. No one's going to get in trouble for plotting to use a national security emergency to nullify an election. And they're still out there doing it and they did fail. And that might lead some people into a false sense of security because we know they're gonna try again, but don't worry, they failed. Except as we're gonna talk about in Georgia at the state level at the local level, they're taking more unilateral control over elections. And then you know what, we're, we're gonna transition now because people are saying in the chat, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, Trump didn't find himself in a position where they could plausibly make good on their plan last time. But what if he was in a better position next time? With that, let's transition into this video. Do you really think that how, do you want uh, ex-president Trump uh, to be the speaker? I would. Have you talked to him about it? I have. What did he say? Oh, I keep my conversations with the former president uh, between the two of us. Yeah, ex- except that you just said what it was about. It was about him possibly being speaker. So, like, what did he have to say about it? Not much because he doesn't know literally anything about our government being speaker or what the implications would be. He likes the idea because he has a vague idea that it would be bad in some way. And if it's bad for the American people and for America, he knows he wants to be involved. Um, but this isn't even. Like the first time that Matt Gates individually has come up with this idea that they would choose Donald Trump to be speaker. Let's go back to July when this happened. And so after the next election cycle, when we take back the House of Representatives, when we send Nancy Pelosi back to the filth of San Francisco, my commitment to you is that my vote for Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives will go to Donald J. Trump. Okay, so uh, this is the fun part of American politics in 2021 where we have to debate the possibility of something happening that is so purposefully stupid and insane that just in discussing it, we come off as kind of insane because we're considering this possibility. But we also can't rule it out because they you know, almost declared a national security emergency last time. So God only knows what they would do. It's entirely possible, Brett, that they talk about this only to troll us. That it is to demonstrate the fact that they have no respect for the mechanisms of government. And they love the idea of just having Donald Trump pretend to be speaker and get nothing done because they don't care if nothing gets done. That said, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't do it because they do a lot of insane BS. So we're gonna talk about why Trump might want to do this stupid, insane thing. But first of all, do, do you think that it's likely? Are we wasting our time by considering it? What do you think? Uh, this is another one of those uh, issues where, like you said, they dictate the conversation so that mm-hmm. every way you can talk about it benefits them. Yes. That's that true. said, so what we, are we supposed to do? And this was something I thought about afterwards because I made a, I took a, a stand on like maybe like 
I wanted to dis- to this is similar to the conversation we had last week where I said we should change the conversation as opposed to have it. But mm-hmm. you still do need I, I I'll kind of change my position. You do need to say this is wrong and this is insane. Donald Trump wants to be would probably kind of want to be speaker of the house because he thinks it involves speaking and he would <laughs> speak all the time and it would be he'd have a Twitter handle that he gets to use. Yeah. The speaker of the house. Um and it's crazy. And the trappings of fascism are crazy ass things happening. Um, and so he would also hate the job of the speaker so much that he wouldn't want to do it. And because of that, he wouldn't have to do the other, you know, the actual the actual job of speaker of the house, which is like devise and push legislation. He only wants, so there are so many specific powers to being the president of the United States where you get the excuse of blaming the end of the road of your initiatives on other branches of government, Mm -hmm. right? Trump is in charge of pushing things forward if he's the Speaker of the House. He is in charge of making legislation happen and get written and get cobbled together. He would push that on to someone else. Now they would pull like a Republicans and Reagan situation during his presidency where he's just a mouthpiece probably. They could find a way likely to fix it. But I think the nature of the job of the the Speaker of the House is such that he would have more trouble kind of saying, I can't believe these other people are doing all this terrible stuff um, than he did as president to stop his, his agenda, which really jokes on all of the Republicans. His agenda is only tax cuts for himself. And just a lot of bloviation that makes you mad. Yeah. So and he could he could do that. I mean, they they could not pass, nor would they be likely to pass any legislation under Joe Biden, even if. And the one of the reasons we're discussing this is because it seems almost almost certain that they will regain the House. They vote in lockstep with each other. So I know like Kevin McCarthy is going to try to be Speaker, but if he tries to go up against Trump, what do we think most of the votes are going to? Go for. I mean, like it seems pretty obvious there. Now, maybe there would be with enough Democrats and some sane Republicans they could stop it from happening. That's a fun thing to gamble the future of our country on. But in addition to all of what you just said about the the bloviating and you know stopping anything from happening, there's also the influence that it would have on the 2024 election. So let's walk through a few things that might happen. So um, he could influence the election were he to run. So for the past 50 years, lawmakers from both parties have centralized legislative power within the speaker's office, which means he could decide which bills, if any, uh, go forward, including to keep the government open or raise the debt ceiling. So he could cause an incredible amount of chaos during a presidential election that might, would certainly influence the election, whether it would help him or not. He would at least have that position as well. When the members of the Electoral College vote for a president and vice president, they cast their ballots in their respective state legislatures in December. If no candidate receives a majority of electoral votes, it falls to the House and Senate to elect the president and vice president respectively. So if they create a little bit of chaos, then what could happen is Speaker Trump, claiming once again that the election was stolen from him, could simply refuse to convene this the session. There's no other mechanism in the Constitution to count Electoral College votes. And without a count, the rest of the process breaks down. What would happen is if they didn't count it under the Constitution, this is literally written there. The current terms of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris would expire at noon on January 20th, 2025. Under the 20th Amendment, control of the executive branch would then pass to the acting president for as long as the House refuses to count the electoral votes or until the next election is held in 2028. Under the Presidential Succession Act of 1947, the acting president in this scenario would be House Speaker Donald Trump. Every step of this is insane, and there are certainly things that could stop it from happening. But there's also a lot of reason to believe that none of those norms or institutional mechanisms or anything like that would actually stop it. Because the thing is, unlike their last attempts to stop Biden from getting inaugurated, some of this would technically be constitutional were they to do it. It would obviously go against every bit of the spirit of democracy. But they at least would be using constitutional mechanisms this time around. I think yes, that's that's one of the many reasons that it would be appealing to them to have uh, Donald Trump as the Speaker of the House. And it's probably one of the biggest selling points. You get to talk whenever you do, you want, and everyone has to listen to you. And 
you're third in line to being president of the United States. And yeah. you have a hand in certifying election results that you can stall as long as you want. Um, and that's yep. that. Yeah. Uh, what's funny about this is if he's in charge of legislation, you know, the, the act that they're putting forward to make it so you have to be a, a member of Congress in order to be like the only reason that anyone who can be the Speaker of the House is because it's not explicitly forbidden in the Constitution. So they would have to enshrine in law something that kind of codifies that you have to be a Congress person. And the name of that act is like a really long name that's that mm -hmm. is makes it the Members Act. So it's like members ensuring it's a sitting representative act. Yeah, I can't imagine what those acronyms would be if Trump was the Speaker of the House. Yeah, I, the I, very, I, very good act. The veterans <laughs> earn respectable yellow uh, violets. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the last thing I'll throw out is, uh, you know, and this is a risk anyway in a country where political violence and the threats of political violence are becoming even more common, but it seems safe to assume that were he to become Speaker of the House, the risk of attacks against the president, the vice president with him third in line, they certainly wouldn't go down. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we're gonna take our second break. We come back, uh, Georgia madness is sweeping that state at least and could affect the nation. So with that, let's go to a break. Uh, by the way, coming up after our program is indisputable. Dr. Rashad Ritchie joined by Dina, Dina Dahl. Shalab Kumar will be on for debate, so uh, very exciting. Uh, and also, I was gonna say, is today Friday? Yes, today is Friday. So Galaxy Brain will be going live at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time at twitch.tv slash TYT. So a lot to look forward to. And as Brett alluded to earlier, uh, Game Busters will be happening as well, correct? Uh, yes, Game I was sorry, I was reading an email. I was afraid was someone was canceling, but they weren't. They're very happy to he be here. just tunes me out. Tonight, John, you talk. <laughs> So much. It's like how my wife treats me. I'm just like, she just she's like, I wasn't listening to you. I was looking right in your face, but I was thinking uh, of something else because I was certain I wouldn't need to use that information you were giving me. Yes, Game Busters is tonight. I already stuff. said that on this broadcast, but apparently you weren't listening to me. We're going to be playing Jackbox games. So join us at 5 30 p.m. That's Pacific, 8 30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash TYT and bring your A game. Do that. That'll be fun. Okay, with that, let's move to uh, not the best news ever. It's recent political news in Georgia, so how could it possibly be good? Okay, Republicans in Georgia have made yet more moves to take effectively unilateral control over the administration of elections in that state. In this case, by purging black Democrats from six different county election boards. So you know, Georgia stuff. The restructurings, they're called, follow the state's passage of Senate Bill 202, which restricted ballot access statewide and allowed the Republican controlled state election board to assume control of county boards it deems underperforming. And that's definitely an objective thing that won't be analyzed from the point of view of manipulating the outcome of elections. In five of the different Georgia counties and that had a restructured election boards as in Troop, Morgan, Pickens, Stevens, and Lincoln, the legislation shifted the power to appoint some or all election board members to local county commissioners, all of which are currently controlled by Republicans. Previously, the appointments had been split evenly between the local Democratic and Republican parties, sometimes with other local entities controlling some appointments. So previously, there had been involvement in the administration of elections at the county level from both the Democratic and Republican parties, which makes sense. You would want to have some input, and they would never accept Republicans being locked out of this at the county level. But they have jumped into locking the Democrats out 100%. In the last of the six counties, Spalding, the party still choose two members each, but the fifth member is now chosen by local judges. It used to be decided by a coin flip. Local judges in that area are traditionally politically conservative. They appointed a white Republican to replace a black Democrat on the election board giving Republicans a 3-2 majority. So in six different counties, and I'm just going to guess that these are electorally significant counties at the Georgia level, they now have control over it. Now, why does that matter? What's the point of all of this? After all, don't the votes still count? Well, technically they do, but the county election boards have broad authority over voter access 
like the setup and um, distribution of polling locations, resources for those polling locations, early voting uh, procedures, as well as provisional ballot tallies, audits and recounts, which we know have been a big focus of the Republicans so far this year. Georgia could be a critical state in future elections, Brett, and they have gained even more control over how elections are managed there. This is business as usual for the Republican Party. And previous to that, the Democratic Party, when every lever of or every available behind the scenes horrible way of restricting democracy, a core American value, we've been told, has been used to keep people from voting if they want to vote for things like equal rights, equal representation, equal pay, equality. Yeah. I've in this, this, so. Why is this happening now? Well, you think of the two different kinds of Republicans in the wake of the 2020 election. You had the Trump type Republicans who were like, throw it out. I hate Democrats and equality. That was the Trump type. And there were the Republicans like Raffensperger who were like, listen, I hate Democrats and equality also. <laughs> but we can't throw it out because we haven't changed the rules yet. Let me get after it and change the rules so I can cite the rules. Yeah. And then we can get rid of democracy. But what they don't tell you is the rule changes are just as detrimental to democracy as it would have been to just disregard the book completely. Yeah. This is what they've always already been doing. This is the kind of move that gets us a nine or a, a six three Supreme Court. This is why in multiple states for the last 15 years, you've had more Democrats receive votes in state elections than Republicans, but you end up having more Republicans get Elect. into the office than Democrats. This is why, and then, and then they come back at you with like, oh, this is a republic, not a democracy. Well, that republic that they've created has no trappings of democracy whatsoever, no spirit of it. No actuality of it. There is no democracy. That's that's what they're against. Yeah. Yeah. And and by the way, making some distinction between a republic and a democracy, that's that's like sort of like faux philosophical cover for specific moves being made that don't have anything to do with republics or democracy that are just naked power grabs. Yeah. It's not like Oh no, Republicans should have control of county elections because we're a republic, not a democracy. It doesn't have anything to do with it. What and, and by the way, I'm gonna say something, I've already said it. I will again say something pointless, which is they would never allow this in states where Democrats can write the rules. But again, it doesn't matter. Them doing this is not them indicating to us a core value of theirs that should be applied across multiple states. In the states where they can, they will steal as much power as they can. It's as simple as that. And in a system where it's as simple as that, and we are constantly reminded of their willingness to do this, not just in Georgia, multiple times just this year, but in states across the country where they've done this or even worse, you then have to have someone who responds to it. Like the, the Democrats at the state level have tried to fight these moves. They don't have the power to actually do so. They can't actually override it. We in the media are trying to make sure that everyone knows about it. You all are aggrieved, you reach out to your representatives. But at some point, someone has to actually do something. And there are things to be done to fight against voter suppression, uh, taking control over voting rolls, those sorts of things, the gerrymandering that we've seen in so many different states. The Democrats at the federal level could stop this, but again, are choosing not to. Which makes us talking about this news even more frustrating on a daily basis because something could be done, but it's not being done. We know what the outcome will be. And nobody is stopping it. They are stealing democracy and the Democrats are watching it and telling us we need to out organize all of what we're seeing. Yeah. Any final it's, thoughts, Brett? My final thoughts are that there should be a nonpartisan districting of states. That's the only thing that makes any sense. But none of the people in charge of the parties want anything to be nonpartisan. The only people who want a nonpartisan system are human beings like you and me. Who are willing to say like it's I'm not on anyone's team. I just chose a, a party because I tend to agree with more of their stuff. But we just want it to be fair and most people to be represented. And they're not interested in that. They're interested in holding power. That's it. 
So fun couple of years coming up. Anyway, that's gonna be the end of our first hour. Thank you everyone on our linear platforms. But if you are watching on YouTube or or Twitch or our members app, we do have more coming. We're gonna take a short break, just a few minutes. We'll be back with more right after this. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.